Welcome to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Our program is sponsored by Awake Us Now. We have a heart to see awakening in America. Revelation is a study many of you have been asking for. So here's Pastor with today's teaching on Revelation. This is week 12 of the Revelation of Jesus the Messiah, a study of the book of Revelation, one of the most fascinating books in all the Bible. I'm Pastor Dodge. Today we're going to be taking a look at one of the most controversial chapters in all of the New Testament. Interestingly enough, controversial chapters are found all through the book of Revelation, but today we're going to be talking about the 144,000 found here in chapter 7 that we're going to be studying this morning. So let's pick up where we left off last time. This is what we read as we begin Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. After this, John writes, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Now, please keep in mind what has preceded this. In the last chapter, John was given a vision of heaven, and he saw this scroll written on both sides with seven seals fixed to it. In chapter 6, we saw the first six seals removed. And now here in chapter 7, we have what I'm just simply going to call a brief interlude. It is a momentary pause before the seventh seal is opened. And it gives us insights into the plan and purpose of God. It has certainly been controversial over the centuries. But I believe there are some very fundamental truths that are quite clear in this chapter, no matter where a person may stand on how to interpret the book of Revelation. And so what we have here now are four angels holding back the final judgment upon the land the figures of four angels being ministers of judgment over the earth. Those are figures that are found elsewhere in the scripture. And once again, we're reminded that the book of Revelation is not written in isolation from the rest of the Bible. Not only is it written with a thorough knowledge of the events of Jesus' life, it is written with a thorough understanding of the Hebrew scriptures, and it flows right from them. And so now, John continues to tell us, verse 2, he gives us the following information. He says, Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. And then verse 3, he says, Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. Okay, here we come to the controversial things. And there are several things I believe need to be mentioned. First of all, this angel is telling the others, don't go any further Don't allow the judgment of God to fall until, until I've put seals on the heads of all of the faithful of the living God. God protects his own. And as we're going to see in just a little while, this sealing of God's people is nothing new in the scriptures. But what it is symbolizing here is protection over God's people in the midst of the final judgment and in the final events of the earth's history. I would also be remiss if I didn't comment on something else here before we go any further, and that is the number 144,000. As I mentioned at the outset, this has been a subject of great controversy over the centuries, not just in modern times. But I think it's very important to note that in the book of Revelation, as in the entire Bible, numbers often play a very significant symbolic role. The number 12 is one such number. Keep in mind, the children of Israel are precisely that. They are descended from the children of Israel. Jacob, the father of the 12 sons of Jacob, was given the name Israel by God himself because he had wrestled with God. And that number 12 would be the number given to the 12 tribes of Israel. 
Jesus, when he chose his first apostles, chose 12 of them. It was done very deliberately. It is a reflection of the 12 sons of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes of God. And so this number, 144,000, when you break it down to its numeric contents, how would you describe this? It's 12 times 12 times 1,000, which means a great number. Keep in mind, the Bible was written before modern hyperinflation. And so today when somebody says, oh, you've got a lot of excuses, an individual may say, ah, he's got a million of them. But in ancient times, they would have said he's got a thousand of them. This is a number that signifies lots. And so 144,000, 12 times 12 times 1,000. For anyone familiar with the Hebrew scriptures, or for that matter, the Gospels, uh, this would be a number that immediately catches your eye. And it's reminding us of God's plan as he chooses one nation, And then through them brings the Messiah who chooses others to spread the message to all the world. And the number grows exponentially. So on that note, let's just move a little bit further. This is what we read in verses 5 and following. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Now keep in mind, Judah was the fourth born of Jacob's sons or Israel's sons. But Judah is very significant because it's through Judah that the Messiah would come. David would be a descendant of Judah. And David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is a descendant of the tribe of Judah. He is the lion of Judah. So 12,000 from the tribe of Judah sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. Reuben, by the way, was the firstborn of Jacob, but Reuben lost. He lost the benefits of being the firstborn, the spiritual benefits, because he slept with one of his father's concubines. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. By the way, Levi is the great-grandfather of Moses. And through Moses and his brother Aaron came the priesthood. The Levites were the members of the priesthood, those who were to instruct the children of Israel. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. And so that's the 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel is the way John describes it. But something's not right here. If you go back to the book of Genesis and take a look at the 12 sons of Jacob, you will notice one of them is missing. And the question is, why? One that's missing is Dan. He's not in here. But there's something else that's a little funny here. And that is, keep in mind, there were 12 sons of Jacob. But Joseph was given the right of firstborn. Joseph's story is one of the most amazing stories in all of literature, much less all of the Bible. And Joseph was rewarded by his father in that he was given a double blessing. And so both of Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, were made heads of tribes of Israel. The one tribe of Joseph became two, Manasseh and Ephraim. But here... Not only is Dan missing, but so is Ephraim. Why in this vision is John given this arrangement? Now, all sorts of speculation has been brought forth over the centuries. One of the earliest speculative understandings 
is expressed by an early Christian author who lived in the latter part of the second century, the later 100s. His name was Irenaeus. And Irenaeus said he believed the reason that Dan was missing from this list is that there was an ancient tradition that the Antichrist, the anti-Messiah, would come from the tribe of Dan. That is certainly one possibility. But let me put forth another possibility. And it is this. Normally, when the 12 tribes of Israel are listed in Jewish culture, Levi is not mentioned because the Levites were set apart. They did not get a physical inheritance, a tribal land. They were scattered throughout the land. But Dan and Ephraim are significant for another reason. You see, when the nation of Israel went astray from the living God, when after the death of King Solomon, the nation devolved into civil war and was split into two countries, Judah in the south and Israel in the north, the northern kingdom of Israel lapsed into idolatry. And their first king, Jeroboam, recognized that people who wanted to worship the living God were going to go down to Judah to the city of Jerusalem where the temple was. And so he decided to set up alternative places of worship. He actually followed the sermon outline of Aaron in the wilderness hundreds of years earlier when the children of God worshipped the golden calf while Moses was up on Mount Sinai. Aaron produced a golden calf and he said, Here are your gods, O Israel, who led you out of bondage in Egypt. And now Jeroboam, the king of the northern kingdom, in the 900s BC, sets up two worship centers where he puts up two golden calves. One of them is at Dan in the north. The other is at Bethel in the south, which is in the tribe of Ephraim. And so idolatry is associated with both the tribe of Dan and the tribe of Ephraim. And that may be part of what is being communicated here, that God is looking for a people who are purified, a people who are wholly devoted and committed to him. And let me just tell you, friends, this is not simply an interpretation of the book of Revelation. This is the call of the entire scripture, and it speaks directly to you and me today. What God is calling for is not a little bit of religion in our lives. He is calling for wholehearted devotion to him. He is not calling us to simple believism where we say, oh yeah, I believe there's a God, and then we go on with life as usual. He's calling us to deep and profound trust in him, that he is at the heart and center of all that we are, all that we do, all that we believe. He is the one who guides and directs us. And Israel's history is a warning to us. It is a warning, and frankly, it is a warning that has been sadly unheeded at many times in the last 2,000 years as so-called Christian people have gone into areas where God never intended us to be and have done things that are an affront to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Dan and Ephraim are not shown in the list. And frankly, both of them were associated with false worship syncretism, a mixing of various beliefs instead of the one pure and true faith. In fact, when it comes to the idolatry in the city of Dan, in the tribal area of Dan, there is a telling witness to that today. Archaeologists working in ancient Dan a number of years ago uncovered the remains of one of the great altars built by King Jeroboam. It was here that the golden calf was set up. You can still see the foundation of that altar in northern Israel on the border with Lebanon.
that ancient altar with the four horns, which was traditional in ancient altars. It is a reminder of how far the people of God fell. And when we read this about the 144,000 who are from these 12 tribes, God is communicating very clearly. He wants a people who are untainted by false worship, untainted by the worship of idols, untainted by worldly understandings and views that are absolutely contrary to all that his word declares. As we talk about that, what we are introduced to is a powerful biblical truth. And that is, although many of God's people have wandered away from the truth in every generation, there is always a faithful remnant. Those who remain faithful to the living God. One classic example of that is found in the life of the great Hebrew prophet Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we have this incredible account of Elijah confronting the priests and prophets of Baal. God shows himself in the fire. And at that point, Israel is called back to true worship. But a day later, Elijah, who has just experienced this incredible work of God, is devastated when Israel's queen, a woman named Jezebel, says, you're a dead man. May the gods deal with me ever so severely if by tomorrow you're not a dead man. And Elijah ran and fled from her. He went down south. He ended up at Mount Sinai in the very cave where God had ministered to Moses hundreds of years earlier. And quite frankly, Elijah, this incredible, devout man of God with amazing prophetic gifts, had a pity party for himself. He said, I followed the Lord's commands and I alone am left. And what does God say to him? I've preserved a remnant. There are 7,000 in Israel who have not bowed down or kissed Baal. There is a remnant. In the book of Ezekiel, we also see that remnant in a very powerful manner. When the city of Jerusalem was destroyed for the first time in 586 B.C., Ezekiel was given a vision of how God would protect the faithful remnant. And we read about that in Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 3 to 6. God sends one of his chosen individuals, apparently an angelic being. And this is what he says. Now the glory of the God of Israel went up from above the cherubim where it had been and moved to the threshold of the temple. Then the Lord called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing kit at his side and said to him, go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark seal, a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things done in it. As I listened, he said to the others, follow him through the city and kill without showing pity or compassion. Slaughter the old men, the young men, the women, the mothers and children, but do not touch anyone who has the mark. The mark is placed on their head. In Hebrew, the word is actually a letter. It's tav. It's the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, today, tav is written differently than it was in Ezekiel's day. Do you know how Tav was written in Ezekiel's day? It was written in the form of a cross. I'll be real honest with you. I do not believe that is an accident of history. It is one of many indications in the Hebrew scriptures of how God has from the very beginning been planning for the salvation of his people, both Jew and Gentile through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection. And in every age, he preserves a faithful remnant. One of the things we need to ask ourselves is, am I remaining faithful? That's not to scare us. That is instead to draw us even closer to the living God. Well, John continues here as he talks about this remnant it's worthwhile to just pause for a second and reflect how many have interpreted the 144,000, okay? 
First of all, the preterists, those who say everything was fulfilled in the first century, they say that the 144,000 is representative of the Jewish believers in Jerusalem who fled the city before the Romans destroyed it in the year 70 AD. The preterist says the 144,000 is a symbolic representation of those Jewish believers who were protected, just as the true believers during Jerusalem's first fall were protected by the mark. So these are protected by the seal. The historicist says the 144,000 represents the Israel of God, true believers in every generation. Many historicists say that this is pointing to the way God protected believers in the midst of Roman persecution and especially after the time of Constantine, as the empire began to crumble and as foreign invaders came into the land, many historicists say this is talking about those who were protected from both death but also from falling away in the midst of that horrific period. The futurist very frequently looks at this and says the 144,000 is the faithful remnant of Jewish believers in the last day. They are often described by futurists as being the greatest missionaries the world will ever know, who following the tribulation, in the midst of the tribulation, bring many people to worship the Messiah. And the idealist looks at the 144,000 and frequently says, this is the faithful remnant, both of old Israel and new Israel, of the Jewish people and of Gentile believers alike. Well, John goes on then, and this is what he writes. He says, after this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All of a sudden, we're introduced to another group of people. We've had the 144,000. And now we have people from every tongue, people, and language. A vast multitude that no one can count. And they are singing the song of the redeemed. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And John writes, he says the following, verse 11, All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. And again, we get this dramatic picture of the worship of angelic beings before the living God in the midst of a multitude that no one can even begin to count from every tribe and language and people. And they are all singing and praising God. And we read this. They were saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. What a song of praise. I need to call your attention to something here. Count the number of words that are used to describe what God deserves. Praise, one, glory, two, wisdom, three, thanks, four, honor, five, power, six, strength, seven. You think that's an accident? God is not only brilliant, but God is incredibly organized (laughs) in the fullest sense of the word. And all of the pieces fit together. There will come a day when everything, dear friends, is going to make sense. There will come a day when this fallen world will be restored. And there will come a day when we will be able to look at all that has transpired and we will simply fall on our faces and say, Amen. But that's not where it stops. John writes and he says, Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? And John replies, Sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. How do you make a robe white with blood? Obviously, this is not talking about a new bleach or a new cleaning product. 
This is talking about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is his blood that covers our sins. It makes us white as snow. You've been listening to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Our program is sponsored by Awake Us Now. Have questions about today's message? Text or call us at 612-545-5654 or email us at mail at awakeusnow.com. And join us again next time for Pastor's continued study of the book of Revelation.